Uh, thank you all for coming. We're, we're delighted to have you here. Uh, this is part of a, of a special series that we have been trying to create to inform the Washington policy community about a dimension that, frankly, very few people in Washington understand. Uh, and that is this remarkable new role that corporations are playing developing stronger society in the world. Uh, and I really first learned of it from Coca-Cola. Uh, back when Neville Isdale was the, was the CEO, uh, started learning about how he viewed this world. And uh, for most Washingtonians, we think about the issues that Achman's going to talk about today, we think about them uh, under the label corporate social responsibility. You all know that term. And it's sort of the price that corporations pay to be a good citizen in their communities. That's not what this is. That's not what this is at all. This is the way that Coca-Cola has reconceptualized its business model. If you are a great citizen in the communities where you operate, it's good for business. It's very good for business. It's, you've got a healthier, happier workforce. They're more loyal. You have less vandalism. You've got better recruiting for new talent. I mean, it's, it's good for business. And that reputation, people that are working for you that find pride you know, and honor in working for you, that news spreads into a community. I mean, it's a wonderful thing. And, uh, but in Washington, we don't, you know, we don't really know about this. We tend to think about the development agenda as government appropriations. You know, what do we spend? And so we're exploring, I think, and this is a wonderful opportunity today with uh, Ahmed Bozer, who runs all of Coca-Cola except North America, just to give you a sense of his scale. <laughs> Uh, so he touches the world, every place, and is going to give us a little bit of an insight in what it means to be a flag bearer, you know, for the values that are so important, uh, we think, for America and for the world. You know, due process, rule of law, responsible, responsibility for the environment, uh, correct and positive and constructive labor relations. I mean, these are the very issues that, that spring from this vision, and it is good for the world. It's good for us, but it's good for the world. And so this is an opportunity for us to get an inside view uh, on how a corporation thinks about itself. And by the way, the best model is to do well and to do good at the same time, because it's not only your mind is in the game, but your heart is in it too. And so we'll have this opportunity. So would you, with your applause, please welcome and thank Ahmed for being with us today. Ahmed, please come up here. Thank you, Dr. Hamry. I think the sound is okay. It's working. Um, thank you for that. Well, I'd like to say thanks for the credit for the weather. That <laughs> makes it double credit for us because when the weather is good, our business does better. So <laughs> and now having credit for that, that's great. But I probably wouldn't like my boss to know that, that I have the ability to, to do something about the weather. Then I would be in trouble. So uh, it truly is an honor to be here in CSIS. Our company has a long, long standing relationship with and a proud relationship with CSIS. I know that it is uh, one of the world's leading think tanks that a multi multitude of constituencies benefit greatly from, uh, including ourselves. Um, and I'm quite uh, excited that we are uh, coming on the business angle uh, to look at how businesses can help the world be a better place because of their presence uh, in those communities. That's certainly what we uh, thrive to do. Um, we do not profess that we've excelled in it, but that's certainly the journey that uh, we find ourselves in. And it, is, it really is a privilege for me to be able to share our journey uh, with a group uh, like yours um, with the hopes that uh, we can start pretty good uh, dialogue and discussion about uh, some of the um, social aspects of our business as well as, as our business itself. So um, looking very much forward to our, 
our engagement. Um, talking about ASEAN, if this was 20 years ago, let's say 17 years ago, less than 20 years ago, I think today here we would be talking about the Asian crisis and uh, the run on the bank, uh, exchange devaluations, high interest rates, bankruptcies, and quite uh, a wave of pessimism about the region uh, and the businesses. And I'm sure at that point in time, if we were projecting what the ASEAN economies uh, will be, uh, we would not be projecting some of the things that I'm going to count now. And um, in fact, please keep in mind the following. Um, I really believe the number one, not the only, but the first social responsibility of the business is the fact that it does the business and creates the employment, uh, creates business for its suppliers, creates business for its, uh, for, for its value chain, etc. So in that light, economies like ASEAN present an incredible opportunity before we get to the point about how we do that business to really become a uh, force for good. Um, if you look at the ASEAN countries today, their GDP right now is at $3.5 trillion as of last year. Now, for a fair comparison, if you say, let's take EU as one, well, that ranks, if you take EU as one, that ranks ASEAN as the fifth largest economy in the world behind EU, uh, United States, Japan, and China. So any other country or group of countries that you could think of is uh, behind ASEAN. If you look at foreign direct investment uh, last year that uh, flew into ASEAN countries, we see a number like $114 billion compared to China, which I think was around $120 billion. So it certainly uh, is of a very significant size. 600, people, 600 million people, that is uh, more than the sum of, well, probably around the sum of EU and, and US, it's uh, almost as large as Latin America, uh, pretty high population. The trading over the last uh, 15 years uh, has actually doubled between these countries. And we know that uh, when the countries start trading with each other, uh, it really benefits the entire, uh, entire community that way. And it's not just about money. If you look at the Human Development Index during this time, you also see that uh, that is improving in the ASEAN countries. Another striking ratio is uh, the poverty levels, which I guess is defined differently, but in, for the purpose of this statistic, it is about a percentage of those people who live with under $1.25 a day, that number used to be in near 50% levels 10 years ago. It is now 16%. So very significant poverty alleviation that has um, already happened. Um, now, if you look at the demographics, it's a, it's a very, very young community, uh, median age in the, in the high 20s. Uh, one other statistic people look at demographics is the dependency ratio, dependency of young people and their parents and then the old people. Uh, so those ratios are improving significantly. So there's a very um, strong demographic dividend that's, that's expected uh, out of the ASEAN countries. I think um, if I list all of these together, uh, 17 years ago when the Asian crisis was uh, storming the markets, we would not have anticipated that. And this more or less uh, sort of underpins the thinking of the Coca-Cola company, where we are present in every country in the world except for North Korea and Cuba, uh, where we take a very long view um, with the assumption that, that you know, the populations, the emerging middle class, urbanization, uh, these demographic trends will eventually uh, work, and the road to get there will not be without its problems. Uh, you know, those problems may last a number of years, but the overall direction of the development of the global economy is that it will 
provide us the opportunities to uh, thrive in these markets, and therefore we invest in them. Uh, if you look to the future, um, we've talked about the demographics. Um, I also believe strongly that as the ASEAN economic integration gains speed, which, uh, which I think it has made a lot of progress up until now, uh, that will be a further catalyst for continued development of these economies. So yes, every emerging market has its challenges. As a global company, we have challenges in emerging markets. Believe me, we have challenges in developed markets, both with financial impacts or, or non-financial impacts. But uh, one is not better or worse than the other. That's part of doing business. Uh, and I would position uh, the ASEAN region no differently than that in terms of the, uh, the challenges that those developing markets are giving to us. So um, clearly, it's a, it's a very uh, compelling investment story, ASEAN countries uh, being the fourth largest economy in the world. A couple of, well, maybe one personal anecdote. Uh, you don't really appreciate the potential of these countries until you sit down and talk to the youth of these countries. And every time I go to these countries, I try to connect with the youth. And uh, you may be familiar with the World Economic Forum's Global Shapers Program, where um, uh, people under the age of 30 uh, who are uh, nominated to the, the Global Shaper are organized on a city-by-city -city basis. And these kids are extremely successful in what they do, some of them entrepreneurs, some of them in academia, yet they come together to try to address the social issues of, of their countries. And uh, I have had a session in Jakarta with the Jakarta hub of the Global Shapers. It was about a two and a half hour session. And I have listened to the story of every single one of these Global Shapers. And frankly, uh, by the time a Global Shaper started thinking, my assumption of the extent and scale of the impact these young people create, um, I found out that assumption was so wrong because these youth are creating an enormous impact in whatever social cause they take. To give you one example, we've heard a story where from nothing, one, uh, a uh, young lady who graduated from, I think, pharmaceutical or agricultural discipline uh, has actually created a business of creating rose soaps. And the reason she did that was she was concerned about the uh, wealth of the farmers or the unfairness in her mind of how the farmers were benefiting from the rose farming. And she went into business to solve this problem. This is the kind of thinking that's coming out of the grassroots of the youth in these countries. And this is when you know, regardless of the problems uh, we may face in the short term, elections may uh, you know, introduce uh, some questions, then things will be OK, and then you'll have other questions again. All of this will happen, but the people, the youth in the region is the source of uh, confidence and hope that we, we all can have. In these, uh, in these economies. So a little bit uh, about Coca-Cola. Um, our business model, uh, some of you might know, but is one of the most fascinating business models of, uh, I think, business history, is what I would say. And it is that uh, incredible combination of local presence and global scale at the same time. So it is local because everywhere we do business, we produce in the ASEAN, countries, we have 47 manufacturing plants. We employ around 34,000 people, our system employs in these countries. And we get to uh, 4 million outlets, day in, day out. We are in these outlets having a relationship with, with the uh, retailers. Um, and we've been there a long time. Uh, like in Philippines, we've been there in over 100 years. And in Indonesia, 87 years. And in Myanmar, as you know, close to two years. So quite. But it is a local business where we source ingredients locally. 
We hire people locally. We pay taxes locally. We serve the local customer, local retailer, and our supply chain is completely local. Yet, we are a global company that can bring expertise on many issues. Uh, we can be very quick in uh, being able to establish supply chains that meet the quality standards that, uh, that we have, which applies equally around the world. Now, what that also does is because we source locally, if we are to buy certain ingredients from a local supplier, they're going to have to meet those quality standards. Well, what happens when they meet those quality standards is they become better suppliers. That they can actually start exporting to other parts of the world because of their quality standards uh, being raised. So um, this combination of uh, local and, uh, and global uh, allows us to operate in 205 countries in a way that makes us part of the local communities uh, with the right relationships um, and with the right understanding of the consumer and the customer uh, in those markets. Now, Dr. Hamry mentioned uh, briefly um, about the way we aspire to go to business uh, in these countries, and I'd like to say a few words about that. The question about uh, social responsibility of the business has been around for a long time. And we all remember, maybe 35, 40 years ago, different schools of thought where you know, the social responsibility of the business uh, is really just to make profits, was one school of thought, whereas uh, there was another school of thought saying businesses has to be more active in the social area. Uh, we believe that debate uh, should really no longer be had in those either or terms. Because the reality that we face day in and day out for a brand like ours, with a presence like ours, global footprint like ours, people really look to us to do the right thing. Or they keep us accountable to, uh, to many things. So for example, um, in the case of water, uh, we have been a, uh, we are a, a, a user, user of water everywhere we, we operate. And in those communities, uh, you may be facing uh, water shortages. So addressing the water challenges for us is not a matter of social responsibility. It's a matter of sustainability of our own business. But the beautiful thing is, once we see it this way, that we want to make our business sustainable, well, first, we have to make sure that our community is sustainable. When we make the community sustainable, they want us to stay there. And we've had wonderful examples of that um, in India, where uh, for uh, whatever historical reasons that uh, the plants that we have might now be in water-stressed areas. But if, and, and a great example where, where we were able to do is that we have connected with the local community and supported those farmers to have more efficient usage of water, as well as recharging the water back uh, to the ground. Because in India, it's not the fact that there's not enough water. There is. It's just there's too much in a small period of time <laughs> and nothing in a, in a long period of time. So if you can steward those water resources to recharge back, so you're actually solving the problem. And when the local community farmers are benefiting from that, um, because A, you know, we are recharging more than we're using, so we're, not a, we're a net contributor, but we're also helping them to be more efficient users of water to get better yields. Now, you can call this a social responsibility, but we call it business because our business in this case uh, is a, on a much more solid footing for a sustainable long-term growth if we, had, if we do not act, uh, act in this way. Um, another uh, very important uh, initiative that we have, which again is, is a business initiative which happens to have a very positive social impact in addition to the uh, creating employment, etc., is the uh, empowerment of women. And um, all around the world, if you look at the statistics, I think this might be from uh, United Nations, I'm not sure, but the statistic goes like this. Um, 60% or 66% of the, all the work done in the world are done by women. Yet, 
only 10% of the income earned is earned by women. So there is uh, a stark um, discrepancy uh, uh, or a statement of fairness in there. Yet, with the 10% of the income women earns, um, they invest what they earn with their families and with their communities upwards of 90% so of what they earn. So then the theory goes that if you can actually economically empower women around the world, um, that will help the communities become better communities, which I think is a very, very solid, uh, <coughs> solid proposal. It is on that basis that our company has made a commitment to economically empower 5 million women by 2020. Now, the beauty of this is that the economic empowerment happens within our supply chain. So we have go to Africa, go to, to China, in other parts of Asia. In our supply chain, you would see significant amount of women either as retailers or distributors uh, that are working in our supply chain. We know their issues and problems. Sometimes it's difficult for them to run their finances. Sometimes it's difficult for them to access financing. Sometimes they need to be networking with their peers. And sometimes they need to get learn about better business practices. So all of these things are little things that the companies can do that help the women in business to be better business people, to balance their budgets, books in the right way so that uh, they, can, uh, they can be more efficient with their money. And um, so that's our 5 by 20 program where uh, we have uh, committed to economically empower 5. So again, this is not necessarily a social responsibility program. It's a business program because when the women entrepreneurs are successful in what they do, that means our supply chain works better. So um, again, this is our way of fusing the business objectives with the sustainability objectives uh, that we face. Um, third area of, of, of sustainability that uh, we uh, get involved in a lot is the well-being. So it's actually three W's, women, water, and well-being. And uh, obviously, that's our commitment to a, to a, a healthy generation of uh, of people in the world to come, and we see that, you know, we have all become a very uh, a lot more sedate generation than uh, we used to be. We don't move as much, and one thing that we hear that the medical community, scientific community, agrees on, is that if we all moved a little bit more, if we were a little bit more active, um, that would improve the well-being that uh, that we're looking for. So we have committed to uh, having health and well-being programs, healthy, active living programs in, uh, in, in a number of countries around the world. Right now, we're in upwards of 120 countries where we're touching uh, millions of people with programs like Copa Coca-Cola, et cetera. And the health and well-being uh, of, of the communities are critically important to health and well-being of uh, our business. I'll touch on... One final thing very specific for uh, uh, Southeast Asia, and, um, and that's Myanmar. When we uh, declared or started investing in Myanmar, um, there were a lot of questions that uh, we would get from the business community. Well, what about human rights in the country? Uh, what about transparency? Uh, you know, what about environment? You know, we don't know much. How can you actually go just like that and, and uh, start an investment in Myanmar? Um, and those were all very valid questions. Those are all very valid questions. But uh, we have actually taken this approach of involving the right stakeholders from the very beginning, and we have conducted an extremely detailed due diligence process, which we have filed with the US State Department. Today, you can go uh, on the website and, and look for Coca-Cola uh, doing business in Myanmar, or that's the name of the report, I think. 
uh, that you would see every single area of due, due diligence that was done. And uh, we have gotten a lot of accolades from people saying how transparent we were, and we've really uh, were leading the way in, uh, in, in doing business there, demonstrating the fact that even uh, in environments that may not be so well known to everybody, that we can establish certain principles and values that apply to the whole world, that we uh, follow everywhere, we can do them in Myanmar too. And we can explicitly state our policies and procedures and how we are going to do that uh, in Myanmar in connection, thanks to uh, CSIS with their support in connecting us uh, with the various stakeholders there um, and start our business. So it was a question of not just promoting our brands, but also promoting our values in terms of how we do business. So that now we can talk about becoming a force for good in Myanmar rather than dealing with all the other questions that, that we were faced with. So um, in conclusion, I would like to assert that those of us in the, in the business world and those of you who look at us, that business can really be a force for good for a number of things. We have a lot of resources. Um, probably the sense of accountability in business uh, is among the uh, most stressful type of uh, accountabilities that you can have. You have to deliver results. So you have to take action. So it is business is an incredible institution that can make a difference. And if business sees its horizon as long term as infinity, we see ourselves as leaders of carrying the torch from one point to the other and the next person takes, but the business enterprise will live forever. If you look at it with that kind of a mindset, the only way to think about it is to ensure that the communities in which we operate are healthy, are thriving. Therefore, we make that part of our business model going forward. So with that mindset, I think it becomes a very, very powerful force. There's, of course, one more thing that makes, that allows us to make this impact so much more. And that is the concept of what we call the golden triangle. The problems of our world are so immense that no one business on its own can really look to make uh, a material difference. But I think when the businesses and the governments and the civil society find ways of collaborating behind common goals, then the impact becomes so much more. And this is what we thrive to do. And this is difficult. It is very difficult, uh, even sometimes within a, within a company, that different departments sometimes have challenges collaborating with each other. If we're talking about businesses, governments, and civil society, that's a tall order, and we uh, certainly are committed to those, and we have uh, many good examples of those uh, uh, golden triangles that's making a difference in ways that we have not envisioned at the time we started these golden triangles. Um, so if we can sort of mount that concept to the concept of um, this really long-term business outlook which looks to uh, exist within sustainable communities, then business can be a wonderful force for good um, and, uh, and impact people's lives uh, for the better. So, and I think that in turn um, would strengthen the position of the business and the community, would strengthen everybody's position in the world, it'll be good for the United States, it'll be good for the world, uh, and um, it'll be a virtuous, positive cycle that we will all find ourselves in. So. Um, I'd like to conclude my comments here and to allow some time uh, for debate and dialogue, but this, this is the message I, I just wanted to share with you. Thank you. Thank you. Take a seat. Take a seat, yeah. And I'm going to have my Coke now. So. <laughs> Ahmed Bozer, thank you very much for that. Um, 
very uh, interesting and insightful overview of the role of ASEAN, the importance of ASEAN, the economy, its importance to the United States uh, economy, the importance to companies, and for your description of how uh, how comp uh, companies like yours, particularly Coca-Cola, operates in, in the region. Uh, my name is Murray Hebert from the CSIS uh, Southeast Asia program. Uh, I have the honor now of uh, chairing the, uh, moderating the conversation with uh, Mr. Ahmed Bozer. Um, so uh, if I will recognize you if you have questions. Uh, there will be microphones. Uh, please wait for the microphone. Identify yourself. And um, uh, then please ask a question. Um, so in the back there. Good afternoon. Thank you. I'm Stephen Donahue from McClarty Associates. One of the things that you said that intrigued me was this uh, view of having a uh, long-term horizon. As a publicly traded company that has to provide quarterly earnings reports, how do you convince both your shareholders, but especially the market watchers, that that's a good, uh, a good policy? Yeah. Thank you for that. And that's a, that's a very uh, live and real question. Uh, you know, in today's business world, and probably this was the case a uh, long time ago as well, but one feels this, that you always have paradoxes. You have the short term and the long term. You have to have global scale, but you have to have local presence. And I could count so many other paradoxes. You have to uh, deliver your core business like Coca-Cola. You have to do new businesses. And these are all paradoxes. And, and we believe that the, the, one of the key tasks of the leadership of business is to be able to rise above those paradoxes and do the right thing. Because at the end of the day, we know that a myopic focus on the short term is going to be harmful for us in the long term. And then, by the way, uh, that time comes quicker than ever before. Now, a single-minded focus in the long term might get you in trouble because uh, you may not get through the short term to get to the long term. So it is a paradox where you have to, uh, you have to address both. Now, how does it work? How do you address both? I think in reality, in reality, if you really think deeply, most of the decisions that you face um, are probably not so paradoxical. And I'll be happy to share an example if I'm not taking too long to answer a question. There are some decisions that are paradoxical in that regard. And yes, you won't always favor the long term. But those would be in terms of maybe delaying that long term initiative by a certain amount of time, rather than taking a mindset of being completely close to that. So within that mix, uh, it, is, it is something that needs to be managed, but uh, I would consider that we would not be doing our leadership task properly if we accept the fact that because we're a public company and we have to deliver quarterly results as per expectation, and therefore we cannot be focused in our long term, then we shouldn't do our jobs. We should go somewhere else and do something else. So that's what the business requires from us. It's not a perfect equation all the time, but I think it's a, it's a viable journey. Alex? Alex Feldman from the US ASEAN Business Council. Um, you talked about ASEAN, but uh, I'd like to just go back to that a little bit and understand how Koch sees the ASEAN economic community, which as you know, will come together officially at the end of next year. And whether there's, you know, we've got uh, 54 or 47 uh, uh, manufacturing plants in Southeast Asia. How are those going to sort of have a local presence, global scalability? Is there room for something in the region and, and, and sort of taking advantage of the regional opportunities that ASEAN might uh, offer, even though the, your, your business is, is very local and you've got to go down to the individual uh, operators? Yeah, uh, actually, that's a great question. And um, generally, the Coke business, uh, I always use the term, it is um, uh, sort of small. If you look at a case of this product, it's sort of big in size. 
but small in value. Those kinds of businesses that every time it's 50 cents that you're charging, um, you know, yes, there are opportunities to scale production in certain ways in, in certain cases, but generally, um, you know, you would always have a local production facility to, to do that. However, um, you know, there might be different kinds of products that might be enabled better, scaled quicker within the, uh, within the community uh, that this integration could give us an opportunity to, you know, maybe produce in one country and, and distribute in many. But for most of our core, um, that, would be, uh, that would be the case. Um, having said that, I think we would indirectly benefit a lot from the integration, economic integration, because the tide would be rising, and, and I think we would be rising with that uh, as a result. Right. Back there. Hi, I'm Aviva. I'm a PhD student in public policy at American University. I grew up in Guangzhou, um, China, during the economic reforms. So I'm probably the first generation of Chinese mass consuming Coca-Cola, McDonald's, and like his shoes. So I think one of the amazing thing is um, you actually change our lifestyle. So um, you know, Asians have a very stubborn taste uh, about food and drinks. But uh, what is the difference is, say, um, Starbucks, when they first entered the Chinese market, they tried to position their brands as luxury brands. But you never did that. So uh, have you ever worried about what happened if Chinese people don't like this special taste? Uh, or you know, why do you stay in the very um, popular line of the market? Thank you. Yeah. Well, one of the reasons I love this product is that it is the same product that anybody in any social uh, strata in any country can enjoy and have the same experience. Uh, you, there are not too many products like this that can be so far-reaching. So um, that's, that has been our, our ticket. And we have been very fortunate. I think we're uh, uh, sort of standing on the shoulders of a lot of giants that have started in, in 1886 and, and brought this business 126 years to create this product and taste that uh, um, you know, everybody around the world enjoys very much. And uh, uh, once uh, we have the uh, ice cold, perfect serve of Coca-Cola, and once you experience that, it's a taste that you li like. It uplifts you. It refreshes you. Uh, and it works in China, too. China is one of our very, uh, very important countries, of course. So hope that answers the question. Matt, if I could just ask you a question from the uh, from the moderator. Um, you, know, you you talked about. I'm going to ask you about Myanmar. You talked about the due diligence and the various activities you you needed to to, to follow to do your investment. It, you also have done some special projects to empower women. And I think it might be useful. People would appreciate hearing so, sort of the kind of model you used in Myanmar to. Uh, Beyond uh, just uh, beyond your investment, you also have a have a project to to boost the livelihood of women. Yeah, and that's in line and and part of our uh, five by twenty, the empowering five uh, million people by twenty twenty. Obviously, those five million people would come from different countries around the world, including Myanmar. And I've also talked about the golden triangle. Um, you know, we are able to make those efforts a lot more effective if we have a local NGO or the local government who are working with us as, as part of this project. To, uh, uh, so uh, we have partnered with a local NGO. We've, again, brought our own 5 by 20 team into it and our country operations team to execute the projects uh, in that regard. Mm -hmm. Please. My name is Ed Gerwin. I'm an international trade consultant. And thank you, Mr. Bowser, very much for your remarks. They were very, very helpful. Uh, I think they were eye-opening to many of us who follow global trade. Uh, my question is about the many people uh, more broadly who don't follow trade as well. And when you listen to the debate, and they talk about things like foreign investment by American-based multinationals, you hear these very simplified, dumbed-down stories. You know, companies invest so they can 
pay slave labor wages and send dumped products back to the United States. As you know, that's not the story. But the question is, uh, I know it's difficult for you to kind of brag on yourselves and to uh, talk about what you're doing, but what can those of us in the larger community do to better get, at, get that message out so that people have a more complete and nuanced understanding of what what our uh, U.S.-based multinational companies actually do for good in the global economy? Yeah, um, great question, and, and I hope to, uh, well, I don't mind to, I don't mean to, I should say, sort of reverse the question, but, uh, you know, we try our best to tell our story the way I've done in multiple platforms, um, including directly with the governments and, and the civil society. Um, I think I would say, if I had to say one thing about what we can do uh, about this, is uh, we very frequently encounter um, sort of negative thinking about any subject. Uh, this world is a very dialectic world. There's great stuff that's happening, and there's terrible stuff that's happening. Okay, That's probably going to be the way it is for a while. So we unfortunately hear a lot more about the negatives. So I think my call to everybody in here is that um, you know, if we step back and, and look at the total picture, we would see more reasons to be encouraged that uh, these types of investments uh, are actually becoming a force for good. We face this in, in many other forms. Uh, we sometimes have to go to great lengths um, to prove that we're really <laughs> trying to do what I've just talked about here uh, without any other uh, uh, secret agendas or anything like this. And some parts of the world, people are more skeptical about, uh, about these. So we have to keep uh, the positive yet uh, rational uh, outlook on this and, and keep uh, giving the message that way. I, I'm sorry that I don't have a better answer than that, but that's the only thing I could think of. Please, back there. Thank you. My name is Adam Murray. I'm from the Department of State. When you mentioned the Golden Triangles, it, it sounds a lot like uh, the public-private partnerships that we talk about um, in government. And I'm wondering if you could um, address maybe, are there specific areas where those types of partnerships are, are really effective whether that's in promoting transparency or health or environmental protection. And from the viewpoint of the private sector, what makes a really effective partnership with the government? Thank you. Sure. A um, couple of examples I could throw uh, from Africa, uh, even though it, it's outside of uh, Asia here, but the ones that uh, I felt uh, really left a very good mark is that in Tanzania, uh, the government had a problem of um, getting certain medicines to remote parts of the country. So people look at us in Africa, they say, well, you are the most widely distributed product. There are many places in Africa that you can't find sometimes even the basic necessities, but you can find Coca-Cola. So, well, maybe we should go to Coca-Cola and we should put in their trucks all the <laughs> medicine. And of course, it doesn't work that way. So, uh, you know, we, we, we cannot use our distribution system to solve the world's problems. However, this is where we formed a Golden Triangle partnership um, with the government and with other companies uh, to share our supply chain learnings. How do you set up the best supply chain in a country like Tanzania to get those uh, medicines to uh, remote parts of the, of the country? And we've had a significant, I, I don't remember the number now, but significant increase in the availability of this uh, of these medicine. And, uh, and that made a difference, and that was a great example. Uh, another one we have is uh, what we call Project Nurture. So here, here's a great example. We are going into juice business in Africa. We have been in it. We're, we're growing our juice business. Well, um, you know, we use mangoes. We use passion fruit. We use all kinds of fruit. Well, can we not grow those fruits in Africa in an environment environmentally friendly way and help the livelihood of the farmers and then buy those products from them because what they need is the is the 
visibility to the demand for their products. So we've done Project Nurture with uh, TechnoServe, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and Coca-Cola. Again, another Golden Triangle partnership where we have trained 50,000 farmers. We've actually made them more efficient. We've upgraded their technology, and we're buying their fruits and uh, for, to create fruit juice for ourselves. So those are the kinds of things. Uh, I guess what it boils down to, to your second question, is um, whether it's the government or, uh, or NGOs or the, or the tripartite, let's say, um, that we got to take enough time up front to be very clear on the opportunity or the problem we're trying to solve. Then ask ourselves, what do we really, honestly, have to contribute to that? You know, we are very clear as Coca-Cola company. We are, we think we're good in marketing. You know, we're recognized as a marketing company. We can get messaging across, and, and, and um, uh, that's, that's one thing. And we have uh, distribution opportunities. We have great partnerships all around the world. We have an incredible global reach. It is, Coca-Cola is a bit like a passport. You know, when you, actually, when you're in the passport line, they ask you, what do you do? You say you work for Coca-Cola. They look at your passport shorter, I think. They <laughs> Sometimes they don't. So we're everywhere. So those are the assets we can bring. So the other part of the, of the golden triangle also has to be very clear. And how can we mix and match these strengths to solve whatever issue we're trying to solve? So uh, I think if that kind of time could be spent in the, in the uh, public-private partnerships, they would be a lot more uh, successful. Thank you, Mr. Boza. My name is Jean Nguyen with Voice of Vietnamese Americans. I thank you for your work and I thank Coca-Cola for the path that it has been serving in Asia. Um, I'm from Vietnam. I'm now a Vietnamese American. And I thank uh, Al for talking about ASEAN and you had talked about the three W's, women, well, well being and water and water uh, the water is the important i'm asking you if you have in your uh, program any thinking about the mekong river that where myanmar cambodia laos and vietnam and thailand all comes together with the needs for water and the women there would certainly need your help in empowering them to do whatever that you think could be and in that if I may um, have the privilege to work with you, with our NGOs and civil societies in those countries, because I had the uh, opportunity to know quite a few people working in the project of Low Mekong Rivers and very concerned about the situation of the Mekong River. Recently, they had a, a summit in Asia. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, we, we have this partnership with the uh, World Wildlife Fund where we're focused on uh, a number of river basins around the world. I believe Mekong Delta, Mekong River is part of that. Uh, I think the best way to pursue your question is if we can connect with uh, Matt and Kate so that uh, they can provide you more information on, on that project and the uh, women's empowerment part of that and uh, see what, uh, what opportunities could be identified. Thank you. Please, sir. I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a consultant. Uh, in bringing together uh, your golden triangle, are you able to use the internet to get more transparency and get the local communities and uh, supply chain people all together and express their views in a transparent manner? Um, great question. Um, the uh, use of uh, social media uh, obviously is is top of mind for uh, all businesses. Uh, for a business to become, um, let's call it a social enterprise in that sense, in all its forms, it's a journey. Uh, I think Coca-Cola Company uh, has made incredible strides in social media. Uh, I think we have now 70 plus million fans in Facebook. So we are in social media uh, with our consumers, connecting with our customers. I think what you're suggesting is to extend that social presence to uh, the Golden Triangles and others, we may be doing it, to be, to be very honest. I don't know the specifics, 
But even if we're not, I think that's, a, that's an excellent uh, suggestion to, to continue to expand our social media presence. Please. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Paul Randolph. I'm the director for East Asia and Pacific for U.S. Agency for International Development. And on behalf of USAID, we've had a number of very productive partnerships, uh, I guess, in your Golden Triangle uh, model uh, around the world, but particularly in East Asia and Pacific. Um, most recently was uh, in response to the typhoon in the Philippines, where Coca-Cola has partnered with USAID to uh, reestablish over 1,000 of the local, what they call Sorry Sorry stores, um, to reestablish businesses which are mostly run by uh, women in the Philippines. So we thank you for, for those partnerships and we look forward to more. Um, you mentioned the, uh, your re-engagement re in, in Myanmar and starting up in the last year and, and starting a uh, responsible investment. And that's very much something that I know the U.S. government is promoting uh, in for, for the Myanmar re-engagement. Have you seen other businesses uh, kind of joining Coca-Cola's model and following your lead in, in the sense of how you're approaching your re-engagement to make sure it really is an inclusive economic opportunity uh, for all the people? And uh, do you work, for instance, through like the ASEAN Business Council or others to, to promote that model with other investors? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for uh, your recognition of our great partnership and sharing the information on Philippines. Uh, we do get a lot of questions from uh, the business community about Myanmar, and we could sense that there is a lot of consideration and excitement uh, about uh, following our path. And um, so uh, that has not necessarily yet you know, translated into a, a specific investment uh, at this stage, but uh, we are quite encouraged by uh, the phone calls we get about uh, asking people asking about Myanmar. And generally, when Coca-Cola goes in, because you know, we may not be, uh, our multiplier effect may not be as much as an auto industry or something, but it's, it's not, it's considerable. When uh, you know, generally our multiplier effect is one to 10. So it is only natural that this will happen over time because, we, because we've gone in there. Please, in the middle. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Shinichi Sobe with CSIS. Uh, my question is regarding uh, TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is negotiated among 12 countries, and I think uh, four ASEAN countries uh, included. Uh, if this trade pact is enacted, uh, do you think it's going to raise your business cost in emerging countries because you have to follow high labor environment standard, or is it going to be an opportunity to promote uh, universal value? Uh, any views appreciated? Thank you very much. Sure. Um, thank you for that. And um, we, as I said, we strive, and it's very important for us that we operate with the same value set around the world, whichever country we're in. Uh, so uh, what happens with certain trade agreements or associations doesn't change that from our standpoint. So for example, if when we make a commitment, we make a global commitment. We made a global commitment about uh, the quality of our uh, wastewater treatments all around the world. Well, that applies to Afghanistan, Iraq, Yemen, United States, Germany. So it applies everywhere. That's, that's uh, uh, as a global company, we cannot afford to to have different uh, standards. So as it relates to TPP, um, the, the real benefit for us will become, I, I don't know, I haven't looked in detail about whether this would have a cost increase which, uh, on us, so I, I cannot answer that. But we know that overall, we see this in Africa, we see this uh, everywhere, where, the, um, where there's more trade, international trade and investment going back and forth between countries, it benefits everybody, and it benefits our business as a result of that. Amit Bozer, thank you very thank much you. for joining us thank here you. today. Uh, we I really appreciated the opportunity to, to understand a little more in depth the role that the business community plays and the role of Coca-Cola Company in the sort of larger role of the US foreign policy and 
and the role of the U.S. Uh, in, in, in the larger community. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you.